Hello, everybody. I'm Sean Reynolds from Sportsnet, about to be joined by Ken Weeb from the Winnipeg Free Press. Together, we are Kenny and Rennie, and it was a little bit of a Kenny and Rennie road trip. We're here together in Seattle. A little bit of a, you know what? We've always had a bromance, but it it definitely sprouted here in the city of Seattle. We got some sushi together last night. Paulie Edmonds joined us. Mike Bradley, our cam- my camera guy out here uh, for for Sportsnet, had a had an intimate little affair at the oldest japanese restaurant in north america great stuff uh if you were wondering who you should listen to when it comes to food and restaurant uh suggestions rennie wins out over kenny it, the the proof is there it happens time and time again don't worry about it a rennie pick worked out another one worked out today uh so hey listen if you're ever heading somewhere don't be afraid to get a hold of rennie and ask him if he has any advice on places to go uh, i've got a book of them mike bradley said I'm, I'm three for three on this trip so far i've got another place we'll get tomorrow but we should get to the game uh and even after the game we should get to the winnipeg jets trade deadline day i I'm going to do something right off the bat here, and I'm going to give the pristine roofing wake-up call to you or any of the people out there who actually were messaging me. And there was a bunch of you saying, Chevy's sitting on his hands. He needs to wake up, all that kind of stuff. You get the pristine roofing inside him because Kenny and Rennie told you they needed to go out and take a big swing. We both said that they would. We both thought they'd get a top six player. We both thought they'd get a defenseman. They went and they did exactly that. All the stress that you've, I I can imagine a bunch of you popping Eno and glasses of water and stuff like that. If Eno exists anymore, drinking away on your nausea a heartburn indigestion pepto-bismol because you've been fretting and worrying and you didn't need to because kenny and Randy told you you didn't need to and as if chevy was going to take a look around at the arms race going on and not make it work instead he was going to go and get some of the best prices you could have imagined to pay for exactly what the winnipeg jets needed we will dig into that a little bit later but no doubt All of you worry warts out there, you get the pristine roofing wake-up call, and that means it's time to give North End Rick the pristine roofing wake-up call at 1-204-981-6289. He's the guy you call to come down and look after any of your roofing, siding, and exterior needs. You can also call Pristine Roofing at 204-237-7663. Remember, Pristine Roofing is giving away a brand-new roof, and they need your help. So get a hold of either of these numbers if you have someone in your life that you know needs a new roof stranger down the street doesn't matter identify a place that could use a new roof let pristine roofing know they will take it into consideration as they give away a free roof extremely generous uh by our folks at pristine roofing to the game um I take a look at this as a continuation of their game earlier in the week against the Seattle crack. And that's a game the jets lost. We told you it was uncharacteristic of the Winnipeg jets to give up as many odd man rushes, high danger chances as they did in that game. It was uncharacteristic of them not to get the kind of goaltending that we expect from them. It all added up to the jets, just barely losing a game. Hey, the third period, which has been dominated by the Winnipeg jets for the most part this season, uh, it was uncharacteristic of them to be outdone in the third period. And what do they do? They come against the same team that they had that game against. They learn from it. They better from it. They Their coaches drop a game plan. They follow that game plan and they return to exactly what we know of the Winnipeg Jets, an extremely stingy team that didn't give up very much in the way of shots, not a lot in the way of scoring chances, defensively sound all the way through. They get back to phenomenal goaltending. Lauren Brassois, his first shutout of the year. I, I've said it once. I've said it a thousand times. This team looks no different with Lauren Brassois in net than it does with Connor Hellebuck in net. That was backed up by Josh Morrissey, who said the exact same thing in his post-game comments. There's no difference in this team in the way it plays or the results it gets, whether you've got Lauren Brassois and Connor Hellebuck in the net. Uh, phenomenal to say that. The push in the third period by the Winnipeg Jets, to me, is what you're coming to expect from them. This was a close game. The Seattle Kraken looks like they're not going to make the playoffs this year, but they play like a playoff team. They pressure really well. They defend really well. This was a really good hockey game, 0-0, going into the third period. And it's those little moments of the game that good teams, and I don't want to say the find a way to win thing because it's overused too much. People too often excuse bad 
performances by teams that end up winning in the end is saying, oh, they found a way to win. I don't like that kind of stuff. Uh, but the Winnipeg Jets in this game were a good team that in the key moments of the game recognized how to turn that game. Josh Morrissey is the guy who turned this game with just a highly cerebral play, the kind of play that only the smartest hockey players are able to pick up situationally in that game. They had a greater understanding, the Jets, of the situations of the game where they could turn this game in their favor, and they did that. And what really was a grinded out potential go to overtime toss up, you know, three on three, whatever happens in the end, it's the jets extremely top end cerebral player at this stage. I have no problem saying it. The jets best player um, outside of the crease is Josh Morrissey. I know that we've given a lot of credit to Mark Scheifele and he's the guy who scores at the beginning of this game. And I'm not trying to take anything away from his game, but the best Winnipeg jet skater is in my mind, um, uh, Josh Morrissey. And I don't think there's much of a doubt about it. He turns this game. We'll dig into that a little bit later on how. But the Winnipeg Jets showed why they are the team that is the one to worry about uh, based on what happens in the playoffs because they are able in these moments against really tough teams to go and turn it up in the right moments of the game championship teams have that feel the Winnipeg Jets are showing they have that feel and based on what they went and picked up today to me this is just another example of a team that has shown it is an extremely serious contender to be the Stanley Cup champions at the end of this year that's my take on the whole thing time to bring in the man with the best music in the business for his take on the whole thing here comes Kenny folks Kenny, we're just two Vittorio men rolling through the city of uh, Seattle, looking like a million bucks as you are right now. Love, love the combo you got going on there. I was on uh, the Sportsnet trade deadline show today. Hopefully people uh, took a look at that. Uh, I got some compliments on the suit as you know you usually do when you're wearing Vittorio Rossi stuff. So if you want to get random compliments texted to you whenever you're on a trade deadline show, I'm probably talking to a pretty narrow audience when I say that. But if you just want random comments anyways on the clothes you're wearing head on down to vittorio rossi on court avenue walk in loudly proclaim kenny and Renny sent you ask for frankie and the boys they will do you up right ken we better be on our best performance here it's almost one o'clock in the morning back home over 400 people in the chat room let's make it worth their while what'd you see here tonight yeah, just a tremendous effort, uh, as you touched on. I mean, the Jets were very disappointed in, in how loose they were defensively, giving up a number of odd man rushes in the Tuesday 4-3 to three loss. A lot of disappointment expressed, uh, but that emotion was nowhere to be found uh, in the locker room post game or this morning uh, after the moves were made by the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, there is a uh, real enthusiasm out there, and for good reason. The Jets uh, absolutely... Uh, added a slam dunk, absolute home run, whatever whatever baseball term you want to use to put it. Uh, and getting Tyler Toffoli, uh, this is one of the best players available on the market. And Sean, you touched on the price. Uh, absolutely ridiculous. The Jets didn't have to give up that Montreal or LA slash Montreal second that will be somewhere between 35 and 39 probably uh, this year. Anyways, we're going to dig into that in a moment, but uh, yeah, just a, so funny, Sean, you you were there. Lauren Brassois sees the media coming in, waiting to talk to Adam Lowry. And uh, he, he basically flat out says that was textbook, right? Textbook yes. defensive effort. Uh, and again, the, the funny moment that you caught that not everyone else in the room caught is Nikolai Ehlers quipping to me, 
as he walks to the back room. Why else do you think I turned that puck over in the third period? Yeah. Um, Lauren Brassois was pretty, again, bored is an exaggeration, but he did not have a ton of work in the game. 17 save shutout. Uh, this guy is absolutely dialed in right now, Sean. That's his 17th start of the year. Uh, that's three now in the last little bit of time for him. You can really see he's in a rhythm and he really, <laughs> he's the kind of guy that on any other team, he would be playing a lot more down the stretch run given how locked in he is right now. And uh, it really is a luxury that the Jets have. I mean, this the story of the year, Sean, in the Western Conference especially, is question marks in goal. Not only do the Jets not have a question mark in goal, they have two of the best goalies in the entire league. And I don't know that there's a better tandem out there. Folks in no. Boston might argue Allmark and Swayman, but no, sorry. I would like to see a general manager who says they would prefer those two over Hellebuck and Brassois. Uh, regardless, Jets were much better defensively. Uh, incredible defensive zone commitment. This was a tightly contested game through two periods, Sean. Very impressive. Both sides, uh, you know, locking it down pretty well. The Jets had more scoring chances uh, through two periods. But, man, 19 block shots for the Jets. There were very few odd man rushes against that resulted in anything. And then, you, as you mentioned, the you know, Josh Morrissey's become the cerebral assassin. I mean, we often mm -hmm. talk, use that term for Pierre-Luc Dubois and how he was able to suck in the opposition for penalties. Morrissey has become the cerebral assassin for the Jets because of his ability. You know he's going to juke and jive you at the blue line, yet he does it effectively every single game, it seems like, and multiple times a game. Uh, Mark Shifley, there he is again, big goal. A uh, big goal needs to be scored. Who's there scoring it? Well, there's Mark Shifley. And who does he point to immediately? As soon as the puck gets to the back of the net and the red light goes on, he's pointing directly at Josh Morrissey, knowing that that play leads directly to a goal. There's Adam Lowry crashing the crease. The same guy who showed great hum sense of humor and humility in going through a 21-game drought. Now he's scored in consecutive games, and now he's looking like the player who led the Jets in scoring in round one against Vegas suddenly. Crease crashing, feeling confident, running guys all over the ice. They did a great job defensively again today, you know, killing off big penalties. You know, there's Sean Monaghan. You know, there's Alex Iafalo with the empty net making a super smart play, shoulder checking in the defensive zone, finding Sean Monaghan, who unselfishly gets it over to Nikolai Ehlers for the empty net cookie. Uh, just so many things about the Jets game that you, that they liked, and for good reason. And and also too, just a, a an absolutely massive day for the organization in terms of taking a a real big swing. I mean, they already took a swing with Sean Monahan uh, earlier. Sean, we know this. Yes, that would have been a smart addition if that was all that they had done, but that was never going to be all they were going to do. So this is the. You, know, you never know how a team is going to react. Sometimes there's a huge emotional lift after a day like that, even when the newcomers don't play. But in a game like today, all we heard was about the excitement the team is feeling about adding championship pedigree. They're adding a depth defenseman who has a big bomb from the point. You know, they already had Monaghan. So two-thirds of their second line has been brought in from the outside. Two incredible pros in Monaghan and Toffoli who incredibly, Sean, they are, are line mates and roommates with the Ottawa 67s back when they were teenagers, before they were even NHLers. Um, and then, too, I mean, Colin Miller, everything that I heard from the scouts that I was talking to today, people around the league, excellent teammate. Uh, you know, we know he's a member of the original Misfits. Those guys were a special group that went all the way to the Stanley Cup final. And it should be a very interesting final 20 games, Sean. I mean, and this was one of them. This was back to the Jets blueprint. And as Adam Lowry described it, this was a bread and butter game. Uh, and there was, and the bread was very, uh, very tasty to them, I would say, uh, based on how they played. Um, 
I'm trying to think. Uh, let, let's get through the game pretty quickly because I sure. think the biggest thing to talk yeah. about at this stage is to get into like the moves that other teams made, how everything stacks up. I know we want to talk about all this kind of stuff, but uh, g- give me a quick thought on Dylan Sandberg, the night he had oh, here. Tonight. We should talk about Monaghan because of how just For like sure. on top of this he is. But start with Sandberg. Uh, and we may even, you know, while we talk about, we yeah, might let's as well do hand out the award. Yeah, uh, love it. Get into Sandberg. I'm going to tell you right now, Sean. I mean, the, the Jets. I mean, <laughs> we asked Rick Bonus or I've asked Rick Bonus about the play, and he was absolutely beside himself that the Jets turned a four on two into a missed net opportunity at one end, and then gave up a three on one going back the other way. But Dylan Sandberg makes such a smart play. This is a, such a great example, Sean, of the confidence Dylan Sandberg is playing with this year. Instead of sitting back and waiting for the play to come to him when he's the lone defender on a three-on-one rush, he makes an assertive, aggressive read, attacking Yanni Gord before he can either find the trailer or find the guy at the back post. So that is an incredibly smart play. And, you know, we've seen guys lay out, but he really did make, did a smart thing because even if he's able to get around him, I, I think that Lauren Brassois is able to shut that down because he kind of ran him out of real estate on the play. But it was a great read, a very assertive play, and the kind of play that shows you why he's playing an enhanced role in the Jets this year. Yes, his minutes weren't super high today, uh, 16-45. Um, you know, it was just an impressive job all around. I thought he was very active. This was a, this was a game, Sean, where he was active offensively, got a couple of good shots off. Uh, he, we know he's a shot blocking machine, smart penalty killer. Uh, I think his confidence with the puck is improving. And this is a guy who, you know, looks like he wants more. I mean, it's not going to happen this year for him, Sean, but this is a guy that I think the Jets believe can grow into a second pairing full-on shutdown guy. We've talked ad nauseum about how effective he and Nate Schmidt have been at five-on-five in terms of goals scored and goals against. But, you know, when a team makes a move, I mean, we're not expecting Dylan Sandberg to come out of the lineup, Sean, but as a young guy, I mean, he was not in the lineup for the opening night a, a season ago. Logan Stanley got the call. So I'm not here to say that he's coming out of the lineup anytime soon. What I am saying is that it's smart as a player on the third pairing if you know if there's going to be some kind of a rotation at some point. Uh, Dylan Sandberg showed why he would like to stay in the lineup again, and, and for good reason. I think he's been absolutely uh, excellent, really taking a step forward this year, and you know that's why we're going with the the Dylan Sandberg breakup as the Johnston Group got you covered no play doubt. of the game this evening. No doubt. Yeah. Hand that out because that was just an absolutely phenomenal play. This is an entirely different game if he doesn't make oh, that yeah. play, right? And the confidence that he makes it with uh, and, and the way that he, I mean, it's a three on one, but he essentially isolates the puck carrier, traps him and, and is is looking for him to try and make that play and beats him to the spot uh, that he's trying to get to. That is, I mean, hey, we we're talking about cerebral. We don't talk about that lots with shut down defensemen or young guys like that, but get, this is entirely him snuffing out a play with great positioning, but with his mind, you know, cutting that one player off on an island is extremely hard to do on a three on one uh, and he pulls it off uh, completely, completely perfect selection for the uh, Johnson group, the Kenny and Rennie OGs got you covered play of the game. And Hey, do you run a small business in Canada? Look to Canada's number one employee benefits plan chambers plan to give you a competitive edge. Chambers plan is the simple, stable, smart choice for over 30,000 businesses countrywide. Visit chamberplan.ca to learn more. Give a sweet, uh, a sweet Lou shout out before we uh, move on here. Ken. Yeah, right on. For folks who have realty needs they would like to have met, contact our main man, Lou Ferlin at Rolla Page Dynamic Realty. Tell him Kenny and Rennie sent you. 204-791-9971 or at the office, 204-989-5000. His email is lou at louferlin.ca. That's L-O-U at L-O-U-F-U-R-L-A-N.ca. Lou Ferlin, excellent realtor, excellent human being, and excellent supporter of the community. 
including this podcast. Before we get going on uh, and talking about, you know, the way everything shook down here, sure. uh, I just got to talk a little bit more about Josh Morrissey. Sure. I honestly am at the stage where, and and, and this is one of these things, I've had this conversation before. Uh, I think I said so uh, uh, on some of the Toronto radio shows. But Josh Morrissey, I highly doubt, you know, if he didn't get it last year, I doubt this year that he's going to be getting um, consideration for the Norris or, or, or serious consideration consideration for the Norris, which to me is an absolute travesty. I'm in the position right now where I don't believe, uh, and I'm willing to say this to anyone who's willing to listen, I don't think that there is a better combination of of um, defense and offense in the NHL than Josh Morrissey. If you take a look around, uh, he he's, doesn't have the points uh, of a Quinn Hughes or a Kale McCarr, or even like a Noah Dobson. But to me, if he's not, like, like I have him well ahead of a defender like Victor Hedman or even Roman Yossi right now. Uh, Bouchard in Edmonton, I don't think he's got anywhere near the acumen when it comes to his defense. Uh, I've Not got cool. him ahead of a guy like Adam Fox and uh, players like that. Uh, t- to me, he is right outside of the top three uh, in what most people should be thinking. But I think the people who are really digging into it and seeing the effect that that player has on the game if we're not talking about Josh Morrissey again, is and I know the the whole Josh Morrissey thing, and I know Winnipeg people are really pushing that, but Josh Morrissey is again. I've I said it earlier. He's the Winnipeg Jets' best player. He turns games in the in this moment in the game, folks. What you're seeing is is him recognizing that the opposition is tired. And baiting that player into thinking that there's no pressure and then trapping him, pouncing on him, turning the puck over and creating a scenario where everyone on the ice for Seattle thinks that the puck is getting out of the zone and out there. There, There's no alarm bells ringing, right? But in Josh Morrissey's head right now, he's thinking, this is it. We've got these guys trapped. It, It is so hard to trap an entire team full of players at the NHL level and be smart enough to do that. And that's what Josh Morrissey did here is sprung that trap. You can see that uh, Mark Shifley recognizes the trap is going to be sprung, which is why he is so wide open and has all that time uh, alone down by the net. Um, This is what I'm talking about when I say that the Winnipeg Jets were better in those key moments. You need someone to do something special. There's very few players. I've said this before. Remember back in the days earlier on, Ken, around the 2014, 15 days, there was a real trade Dustin Bufflin movement in Winnipeg. Everyone talked about it. And I remembered saying about that, Dustin Bufflin is a player that consistently creates something out of nothing. And there's really not that many of those in the NHL. There's a whole bunch of players that skate really well. And a lot of them shoot really well. And a lot of them take advantage when the other team makes mistakes mistakes um there's a very small amount of players that can create those mistakes in a ton of different ways and basically take a nothing play and all of a sudden like that there's trouble going the other way josh morrissey does it all the time over and over and over he takes normal hockey plays where a team thinks everything is fine and turns it on its ear like that people aren't recognizing that about him josh morrissey is a special player and right now i think uh it is so crazy how often he is the key to the jets success offensively and still remains such an unbelievable defender and i'm not saying you talk about you know, those players being the kind of players that make players around them better. Usually when we talk about that, it's like one guy on one line, right? Josh Morrissey consistently makes almost every player on this NHL Jets roster a better player. That's not easy to do. Uh, He is, I'm just going to say this, we're going to go way back uh, on on the payoff here, but uh, just the fact that Rick Bonus walked in and saw something in Josh Morrissey that yeah. I didn't even think Josh Morrissey saw in his in, in himself. I don't think there's a lot of people out there who saw that in him. Rick Bonus saw something in Josh Morrissey almost nobody saw, and he 
has got, he's elicited it from him. He's got it out of him. And man, oh man, that has paid off like crazy for the Winnipeg Jets. And if you're looking to pay off high interest credit cards or debt, we suggest you go talk to our friends at Cambrian Credit Union about their payoff loan. They can show you how taking out a loan to pay off your debt actually gets you debt free faster and can save you thousands of dollars. Go to cambrian.mb.ca to book an appointment online. It'll be a move uh, as brilliant as uh, Rick Bonus turning Josh Morrissey into what we see from him. Okay, anything I want else? To just weigh in quickly here. Uh, I still, you know, Sean, I am one of the voters for the award uh, handed out for the Norris, as you know. Uh, I have no problem saying this because uh, it's already out there. I had Josh Morrissey on second on my ballot. Uh, I was very tempted to have him first on my ballot because I know it's not just an offensive award, uh, but I just could not look at Carlson's 100-plus point season, you know, third in history or whatever it was. I just couldn't overlook that. Uh, I do think that Josh is go- is gaining some of that national recognition that sometimes isn't always there for him, where he was a top five um, in the voting last year, but was not a finalist. I still... I do think that if he continues to play at this level, I don't think he, his play can be ignored. Uh, having As someone who talks to you know, a significant number of voters, uh, one of the things, the only thing that really works against Josh, but it's not his fault. Some people think that you need to be a guy who kills some penalties to win the award. The only reason Josh doesn't kill penalties is because he plays so much without it. It's not that he's not capable of, of killing penalties just those are he plays so many taxing minutes already that the coaching staff rather would have him as a play driver if he was killing penalties he would be very effective at killing penalties he's done it earlier in his career and he could do it again but he plays so much that it's you know it's smarter to use those minutes elsewhere based on the construction of the roster so anyways just a quick quick uh bow on the on that subject we'll move on. i like it i like it um listen uh th- i we this is one of those uh shows it'll be hard to dive into what the audience mm-hmm. says because there's so much to talk about but oh, i had yeah. to point this out darth or excuse me mall <laughs> says i have nothing negative to say about this team right now i'm very excited about the next couple months you can have you ever heard that legend of the person who like surfed <laughs> the internet so much that they found the end of the internet this is akin to that getting to the point where mall has nothing bad to say about the Winnipeg Jets. No negativity to be shared is just absolutely we have found the end Hang of on. the internet. People. If, if when once Bick Ronis copies and pastes that suggestion into his timeline, then we'll know that the end of the world is just around the corner. No, but what we get from Bit, like Maul, give Maul credit. Maul shows up for every single show Always, and brings and a we good love chunk it. of that, you know, the storm clouds into kind of trying to rain on people's parades. Bick Ronis is a no show in times like this. Bick Ronis finds the end of the internet every time the Jets do something really well <laughs> and then shows up when he thinks it's safe to start, you know, beating down uh, on people. So give Maul credit. He's there every single time. And we he love brings it. That his his own special special uh, 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 brand of negativity to the situation, which is you know humor. <laughs> yeah, I, I had an interaction with him, and he was like, he he was genuinely surprised. It seemed that he didn't think that I was taking it as like complete full on humor. Some people like darker humor, you know. You know what I mean? Anyways, uh, good on that. Okay, let's get to what happened today. Um, and Ken, I'm just going to kind of give you the floor. Should, we, the sorry, way to should we wrap, should we wrap keg and lamplighter and just dedicate the rest of the show to the deadline? Or no, not? no, let's do that. Okay. towards. Yeah, I like doing that at All the right. end because I think people, it'll get, it, we'll get this done and then it'll give people a chance to interact a little bit sure. more at the end of the show. So, right um, should we, uh, okay. Get, just wrap a bow on what you saw from the jets quickly. No, I'm good. I'm done. I've, I've You're seen good? enough of that. Yep. Oh, no. Okay. I'll just, I'll just go with it. Like uh, Rick bonus had said here, um, that he needed something more from the, the second line. Oh, we, we, we knew they needed that. Right. So this is one of those scenarios where give credit to the, Okay. What did Rick Bonus do really well this year? That and I, it's I'm going to use this as a chance to beat up on your third line comment because I love doing that. It's my favorite uh, side it. sport to do here. <laughs> but with him basically branding that as their third line and not breaking it up, what he did was he created a scenario by which he said, "Look, 
we've got this, this works. This is something that I want to lock in, right? Now, Ken, you weren't wrong to say or think that Nino Niederreiter moving up to the second line would help spark that line, right? But in doing what he did, keeping the Jets a, a team that really like focused in on their five on five play and shutting down and low goal scoring and have that line kind of be the beacon for it. What he did is, is he showed that even without scoring, this team can win and that the third line was extremely important in that. OK, so you've got a roster put together by your GM and you've got a head coach who says, OK, Kevin, Mr. Shovel Day off. This is how I can best utilize what you've given me here. This is the best way I can put this in to turn this into a powerhouse, a fourth line that works. These are the defense you've given me. We're going to play this structured system and this defense, who a lot of people said was too small and wasn't good enough to be a team that doesn't allow a lot of goals. We turned it into that, right? But what he did is he very clearly identified for Kevin Sheveldayoff, what he needed down the stretch, because he showed time and again that at the top line, they've got enough high end skill that when that line gets going, they're lethal. He's got the third line that does the same thing all year. He's defined that the fourth line with the pieces it has is able to consistently play a fourth line game with a rotating cast of characters. What he did and what he showed and he orated down the stretch was we need to do something with the second line. So it becomes very easy. They didn't have a second line center. We talked about this at the beginning of the year. They tried Cole Perfetti was their first option to try and fix that spot. That didn't work. Then when they brought up Vladislav Nemestikov, they know that they want Vladislav Nemestikov eventually to be maybe the fourth line center or the rover that they've had. So they can't put him in that spot. So what do they need, Ken? They clearly, obviously needed a second line center. Well, Kevin, it's up to you. We need a second line center. Okay, let's see what's available on the market. And they go out and they find Sean Monahan, And he comes in. And so we give Kevin Shovel the off a lot of credit, as we should, for what he's been able to do and him to pick up and the prices he's paid. We'll get to that. But his job is easy. In this case, I'm not saying it's easy to pull it off, but it's easy to identify. I'm going to tell you right now, and we'll get to the Colorado Avalanche. I think the Col yep. Colorado Avalanche are a little more convoluted on what they need to bring in and all that kind of stuff. Whereas the Jets, it was clearly defined. Go find me the best second line center that you can to fit into this system here. He goes, finds Sean Monaghan, plugs it in. There we go. Done and done. It's working. He's been a phenomenal pickup. We didn't talk about his game here tonight. Just like you said, another super cerebral guy, always making good stuff happen on the ice. That works. What's left down the stretch, as Rick Bonus says, we still need more from the second line. You need one more guy in the top six. You need a winger who can score, who can defend, who can do all those kind of things, preferably a winger who's got a little bit of a Stanley Cup pet pedigree or at least has shown up in the playoffs before because that's another thing that the Winnipeg Jets don't have a lot of in their lineup is guys who've gone deep in the playoffs and, and consistently been able to find that playoff performance. So he goes out and he finds the perfect guy for it. But it, a lot of people will say, and, and he should be given credit for it, a lot of people will say, oh, oh, wow, how did he pull that off? But there is a one specific kind of player that he's looking for and what Kevin Sheveldayoff can do on the day before as the trade line is coming closer and closer to the end is he can say, Rick has shown me I need this kind of guy. Well, who are those guys out in the league right now who are available? Let's build a list of them. Okay, these are the guys. Who would we put on our hierarchy on the guy that we would want most on those lists? Okay, we've got our hierarchy. Now let's call those GMs and let's see which of those GMs are willing to deal and what they're looking for. And what you end up doing is you get a, from the outside, we haven't seen it happen yet, but I contend it will be a perfect fit, Ken. I think you will. I know the Jets think that. I know that Rick Bonus thinks that. Absolutely <laughs> excited about getting him. But this is a masterclass by Chevy, but it's a masterclass by Chevy because Rick Bonus made it a very simple puzzle that was put together and finished except for two pieces. Kevin, I need this piece. I need this piece. You think you can go get those for me? That's what he did. No doubt. And because we have the picture in the uh, in the chat room, Rick Bonus cut a Gene Okerlund promo, Sean, <laughs> when you asked him about Tyler Toffoli today. He basically cut the promo 
for the general manager, the players in the room, the fan base, and anybody else who happens to watch the Winnipeg Jets about what Tyler Toffoli brings to the table. First and foremost, championship pedigree, proven goal scorer, guy that can kill penalties if you need him. He's not an overly physical guy in the sense that he gets on the forecheck and runs your defense through the end boards, but you know darn well that he will go to the blue paint, to the hard areas. He's got a great shot, can help the power play in any number of positions, including a shooting position, bumper position, or net front position. Uh, Just an absolute... It's a grand slam. I mean, it, it literally, bases were full. Kevin Shevel day off, knocked it right out of the park. And uh, just an absolutely brilliant move. Now, again, it has to work for sure. We'll have to see if it works. But th- this is not an educated guess scenario. Uh, Tyler Toffoli was roommates and line mates with Sean Monahan in junior hockey. They played together for a brief period in Calgary. This guy has won the Stanley Cup. He has been on deep runs. He brings an understated swagger to the game. Um, He plays with confidence and backs it up. I I love the way this guy plays. And Sean, I'm downright kicking myself that I, you and I were talking about this earlier in the week with Hammer. Um, Toffoli was very high on the Jets list. Earlier in the week, it sounded like the price tag was too high. Now, Kevin Dayoff kind of, downplayed that back home in Winnipeg today when asked about it, if the price had changed. I think Kelly Moore asked him about it. But I used Bushnevich yesterday when I wrote my my piece for the Winnipeg Free Press today. But I should have added to Foley because I knew that was the target. I just thought that because of the scenario they were in, a guy like Bushnevich with an extra, with an extra year was why I prioritized mentioning him. My point remains the same. The Jets were always going to get that second line winger just like they went out and got the second line center you know on february 2nd so anyways when it comes to colin miller um you know we're not 100 percent sure where he fits in sean i got mixed reviews from people i talked with around the league some people think that nate schmidt will stay ahead of him on the depth chart and that miller will be the seventh guy a guy that could either be in a rotation scenario maybe it depends on the opponent Maybe they want to do some load management um, scenario with with Nate Schmidt and Colin Miller down the stretch. I'm not sure, but Rick Bonus gave him a glowing endorsement as well. Uh, He has intel on him from the people he knows in the Dallas organization that had Colin Miller previously. We know he was... uh, Everybody that I heard from on the management side around the league, Colin Miller is a great teammate, um, so he'll fit in well. Nate Schmidt and him were original misfits together. So yes, there could be some awkwardness to a degree because they're essentially competing for the same position as of right now. But that team was incredibly tight. We know that. That means they must be friendly. I mean, Nate's friendly with everybody. So I imagine he's friendly with Colin Miller as well. But again, this is a guy, Sean, we talked about special teams. Like Colin Miller is not a big banger. He's a puck moving guy. Yeah, he plays hard, but he's not a, you know, shut down type of defender he previously has been an offense first guy his numbers are i think he's only got like four goals and eight points he's been injured a bit this year in new jersey we didn't see him in november he came back after in the game after new jersey was in winnipeg where rasmus kapori was injured but this is a guy that can help i mean will he be a regular that remains to be seen but he's a guy that can definitely help matters but the Tafoli. The combo platter of Toffoli and Monaghan, Sean, is absolutely exceptional work. The fact the Jets did not give up one top prospect to get those two, those three players is absurd. And the fact that the Jets still kept that pick that is going to be in the mid-30s probably this year, also an incredibly shrewd bit of business. And Sean, you and I were sitting up here during the intermission talking about this, if if you look back to the, the summer where the Jets brought in Brendan Dillon and Nate Schmidt, where the kind of the culture change began, it, Rick, Kevin Sheveldayoff gave up more, and this is not a knock on Sheveldayoff, he gave up more for Brendan Dillon, who had term, obviously. Than he did for Tyler Toffoli, yeah. Right, a guy that has cup experience. And again, I'm not comparing the two scenarios. The Jets needed to upgrade their defense, and they did. But it, it, that's just exceptional 
business. And if we look back at the last three deadlines, Sean, dating back to the Andrew Cobb trade, what the Jets have brought in in those three years and locked down in terms of extensions, it's an incredible body of work. And it was exactly what Kevin Sheveldayoff needed to do in, in his chair for a team that has not gone on a run since 2018. So at the time we were saying he needed to do some things, he's done those things. And now it's, a, as Kyle Connor told me today, Sean, now it's up to the Jets to, re, you know, they had faith shown in them. Now it's time yes. to back it up with action on the ice during the tw- last 20 games and into the playoffs because this team, quite frankly, can't afford a one-and-done scenario, even if they play a really good team. They need to go on a run and show the league that you know they're a team that can can do just that, win a couple rounds, and potentially, you know, who knows, maybe they can reach the cup final for the first time in franchise history. That remains to be seen. But the moves that they made, it's no guarantee of anything, but it's a guarantee that they gave themselves the absolute best chance to get where they would like to go. Yeah, you nailed it. I, I'll say it like this. Kevin Shevel, day off, it's his job, and I've said it before on this show, it's his job to plug any holes or make the Jets as bulletproof as they can be. Um, I thought it, for any of you out there who are watching our, our Sportsnet trade deadline show today, I thought a lot of the panel talked about it. I had a couple of hits on there. I felt like I was pretty pretty like i felt near 100 percent on it in the comments and a lot of them had just to do with the idea that the jets what i'd said before they had very specific things that they needed to do that would be holes other than that they've plugged all those holes they've taken care of it there's nothing left uh i, I mean maybe like I like the Colin Miller pickup, but like if they were able to get a more significant right hand defenseman, you know, maybe, maybe because the way I see this playing out is I think Colin Miller is, is going to be a little bit in the competition with Nate Schmidt and with yep. uh, Logan Stanley. So, so it's, it gives them options. They have another option with which to go with. And to be honest, I think it probably gives them an option if there's an injury that they don't have to go to Logan Stanley, which is, I think they'd like to go to him for very specific reasons. But based on how he's played this year, I also think they don't want to be forced into going to him. So this covers that off. I still would have liked to have seen them get someone a little bit more significant in that spot. The one miss I had today was juice. Kevin BX had talked about like Cole Perfetti going down to the fourth line and how deep that suggested that this jets team is. I think the one whiff I had is you know, it was on live TV and I didn't have it at the time or I didn't get it out. But I don't know that Cole Perfetti is in this lineup. Like if you take a look at what's happening here right now, he's his place in the in the top six. He had kind of lost with with I follow here uh, and with, with Gabe Velarde being injured. There's no sniff of the top six anymore for Cole Perfetti. And the third line is locked up. So his audition, what he gets to do is potentially be a player on that fourth line. And second, we're power talking play. about, we're talking, well, or like you've got Tyler Toffoli now. Like you, you've, you, but you'd still have him on there with Toffoli, I think, as the setup guy. I think that would be the, as a coach, that would be the, I'm not sure I see it. I'm not sure I see them prioritizing no, that. I think they prioritize Vladislav Nemeskov as their fourth line center. And then you've got, you know, David Gustafson going there. Alex Iafalo is now yeah, a guy who's an option sure. on that line. And I guess the question has to become, yes, we know Cole Perfetti is the kind of player who can produce offense, but can he produce offense while playing the style of play that they want that fourth line to produce? And is he more likely to produce offense playing that role than David Gustafson is or Rasmus Kapari? The answer with Rasmus Kapari is yes, because we know that his ability to generate offense just has not been here this year. But you have to throw Alex Iafalo in the mix. Alex Iafalo has made a career of being 
being, for the most part, a very good bottom six defensively sound player who is able to apply pressure to the opposing teams and put some pucks in the net every once in a while doing it. He's built for that role. Cole Perfetti is built for a top six that he's no longer at this stage of his career good enough to get into. People were asking at the top end of the show what it does to Cole Perfetti. He's going to get games here or there, but for the most part, Cole Perfetti has been pushed down the lineup and is in a position where his job this year, I think for the most part, is going to be to watch and to learn from a very good team ahead of him and pick up what lessons he can to be part of this team in a playoff push in the future. Yeah, that's totally fair. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up Ayafalo and the role that he has played in his career. And I can't help myself. I've been biting my tongue for 20 minutes since you mentioned it again. And I, I totally get it. And I understand why Rick Bonus has done what he's done. I would understand even more if Nino Niederreiter had played a third line role his entire career. He's been a, almost you, exclusively a top six player. And you just mentioned it, Sean. Ayafalo is a capable checker. That was the only reason why I suggested the flip-flop. Uh, anyways, that's neither here nor there. Uh, what we should also mention, and I think it, it, it cannot be understated, Sean, I think one of the biggest reasons the Jets did not take a bigger swing at a potentially, you know, whether it's a second-pairing guy or whatever you want to call it, is that they left room to keep David Gustafson and Logan Stanley on the roster. After deadline day, there is no roster limit with a 23-man roster as long as the team stays cap compliant. So the reason the Jets got the 50% retention is that so they could roll with Stanley and Gustafson and not expose either player to waivers and potentially lose one of those players. It also leaves them the wiggle room to activate at Rector McGroarty after he potentially signs his ELC at the end of the season with the Michigan Wolverines. And just as an aside, Sean, Rutger McGrady tonight with those Wolverines as the Big Ten tournament opened, had two goals, including the game winner in a 5-4 win over the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. So anyways, that is another thing we'll be talking about for weeks to come. But that's okay. part of the reason the Jets didn't, didn't spend a little bit more on the back end when they brought in a depth guy. At least that's my personal interpretation of that scenario. Uh, I would also think that they looked out there. Like, here's something that's interesting is like, you could see the breakdown. The prices yep. for centers were steep this year, right? Like Lindholm for sure. went for a bunch. Monaghan goes for a first rounder. Uh, the Casey Middlestad um, deal to me is an atrocious trade by the Colorado Avalanche. And maybe we'll get into that. But just before I do that, you can see defensemen, you know, significant defensemen went for a healthy price as well. So I think what what I think what Kevin Shevel Dayoff did is he went out today and he said, you know what? I think I can pull this. I think he would have been willing to move a lot out. But I think he went into this and thought, I can yeah. actually pull this off without really having to lose that much and keep our future here. Um, and, and that's what he did. That's what he pulled off. So I think that he probably poked around. I think he probably thought the prices were too steep. And so there's a list of pros and cons by making yep. those moves. You did a very good job of breaking down the pros of him not going all in on someone like that. Uh, I still think though, if he, uh, if, if there would have been the right price out there, uh, that and the right fit. Still, Will still, still would have used up that money. I still think he would have done it. Okay. Yep, so fair. let's get into that. Uh, we got to talk about other teams. I'm going to start with Colorado. I like what Colorado. So I've talked about Colorado and geez, Ken, 730 people in at 1:30 in the morning. Good Amazing. job, chat room. Um, I like the idea of what they tried to do because I said this about the uh, Colorado Avalanche. They needed a second line center. They needed it in the worst way. They had depth on defense th through which to trade through. They also needed uh, to add depth into that lineup because you could see the Winnipeg Jets play them and they're like, yes, you've got the best player in this game with Nathan McKinnon, maybe even the second best with a guy like Ranton. But we've yeah. got more depth and each time the Jets have played them, they beat them with depth. They got harder to play against depth wise with some of their pickups today, or excuse me, over the last little while here. The Casey Middlestat deal, hey, they got better down the middle. So they achieved what they were trying to achieve. They pulled off what they were trying to do. But I think the execution of it is 
atrocious. Bowen Byram is a potential 1A defenseman. Yep. You and I saw him go and win a Stanley Cup. He was one of the best players in that series, in the Stanley Cup. That was a couple of years ago. He's a defenseman. We know defensemen get better as their careers go on. Josh Morrissey is a perfect example of this. Bowen Byram should have been a blue chip trading piece that they demanded something massive in return. And in my opinion, hey, 1A defensemen, potential 1A defensemen do not grow on trees. The Colorado Avalanche treated this deal as though they do. And I get why they did because they've got so many good defensemen in their system. And he was never going to be a 1A as long as Kale McCarr was there. But they way way, way undersold this player. They moved. Someone said it here. They're, they don't see what the big thing about Casey Middlestad is. I know this is a good conversation for us to have because I know you're higher on Casey Middlestad oh, than no. I am. But uh, th- let me just say this and then you can re- respond. I think the win- the Colorado Avalanche moved a 1A defenseman with a Stanley Cup who showed that he can be one of the best players on the ice at the toughest time of the season, and they moved him for a middling second-line center. This is a disaster of a move if I'm a Colorado Avalanche fan. And I think you add all these moves up, they're harder. I still don't think that they're a a team capable of knocking off the Winnipeg Jets in the playoffs. Yeah, first and foremost, uh, I'm not a huge Casey Middlestad guy, and and when people like... uh, like Nick Nick Lenham uh, were suggesting the Jets should be all in on Middlestad. I was not ever getting on that train. Um, I I always preferred Monaghan to Middlestad. Uh, I understand why the Avalanche are doing it because they're going, uh, you know, all in on the skill up front. And, and like we were discussing, I think that you can hide some of the deficiencies in Middlestad's game if you run them out there. Uh, beside Arturi Lekkinen and potentially Valerie Nachushkin, who went out and scored the OT winner today. I love Bowen Byram. I, you and I were there when he played some of his best hockey. Complete um, and total stud. Absolute. Uh, you know, he can be a game changer because of his speed, but there's no room for him on the first power play. So it, it his some of his biggest skills aren't even unleashed by the Avalanche. And they believe in Sam Girard. I mean, Sam Girard got knocked out of the playoffs in 2019 by Vladimir Tarasenko. But, I mean... Those two guys plus Devon Taves are still pretty excellent, but I understand what what they were doing. I, would I have personally done it? No, I don't think so. But um, you know, Chris McFarland's been around the game for a long time. They they address some needs, and now some people are also starting to think more and more that Gabriel Landeskog is going to be ready for the playoffs and potentially even ready for Game One of the playoffs, which makes their forward group even more formidable. Uh, they obviously got some grit for the fourth line in Duhame uh, and Trennan, who we both, Sean, we both love the way Trennan plays. I mean, that's a absolute physical beast. He is a four-checking machine. So I, I I can understand it. I mean, I'm with you. I don't, I don't, you know, I personally don't think I would have pulled the trigger on that deal myself, um, but I can understand the thinking behind it. I mean, they they're addressed also, their needs, but they made a trade just to make the trade. Yeah, I, I, I think this goes deeper. I think that Bowen Byram is a guy who's going to want big dollars on his next deal. Now, I don't have it in front of me, but... It's st- it still doesn't just, mean that you don't maximize the return. They failed miserably to maximize their return. for They they should have been making that a centerpiece and going to the Pittsburgh Penguins and saying, fair. okay, is there any chance we can get Crosby? Because we've got a 1A defenseman here that we'd like to be the starting offer for the package. What else do you need from us? Instead, they've gone and they've got, like I would said, a middling second line center. This is a disaster to me. I, we we should add in here, um, what we know Val Nachushkin is back yeah. into lineup so that's an ad for this team that hadn't been there for the last little while he's back from uh you yep. know the nhl program Player scores assistant. the game yep. winner overtime tonight and adrian dater our pal out of uh, colorado who covers that team has said that from what he's been told L- gabe landeskog is skating at about 75 percent right now and oh, yeah. it does in that he's going to be back for the playoffs, but that from what he's hearing within the organization is it's the first time 
that there's been actual like results that have that organization hopeful that maybe he could be added back. And it's still too much hope for me. You're hoping Casey Middlestead becomes something. You're hoping that Val Nachushkin is going to be able to hit that level that he's been at. You're hoping that Landis God could come back. And you're hoping that if he does come back, he can somehow erase the fact that he's been away from competitive hockey for two years now and get back to his level. Listen, I get it. And maybe it all comes together like uh, Archie, uh, Archie, what was Archie Andrews <laughs> loppy? How it was like held together by dirt and bubble gum. Maybe <laughs> that roster can hold together and find a way to make it through as it shimmies and shakes and almost falls apart. There's just way too many questions about that roster. Uh, I, I think that, um, I'm going to say this, Ken, to me, there is a significant drop off in the wow moves that the Colorado Avalanche used to pull off under Joe Sackick since they've gone uh, with different uh, with a different GM there. Those Chris wow, moves, yep. Chris McFarland, those those wow moves. I have not seen them as much. And I'm questioning what I've seen, what I've seen here from them putting everything together. Uh, go to Vegas, Ken. Yeah, I mean, I liked the Ross Colton uh, pickup in the offseason as well, but, I mean, they changed the complexion. Ryan Johansson was a bet that didn't really turn out. So, uh, Vegas, I mean... Well, they're, uh, they're sitting on Parise, too. That's another one. They're hoping on Parise. Sure. Drew N is in their top six, and Drew N is, like, a guy that I I just don't think has proven anything in the playoffs. Like, there's too many soft situations there that, like, again, they would need miracles to pull it off so that... that that they could hold it together. I really do like, what was it? Uh, the, the two guys, Trennan and Duhame are the two yeah. guys that they picked up. Those yes, are sir. great additions. That's great depth additions. They're a harder team to play against now. I just think that the middle of their lineup is too questionable, too shaky. They're phenomenal oh, totally in fair. their first line. I think they've got a great fourth line. I still just don't think, hey, the Jets had question marks around their second line that got answered and are locked away. In my mind, the, the Colorado Avalanche did not get that. And they've got questions in the crease where the Jets have zero questions in their crease. Yeah, for sure. Georgiev is still a big question. And sorry, just wrapping up Byram. Byram has one more year at 3.85 on a bridge, but then he's going to want probably 8 million or, or north of 8 million. So uh, I think that was also a factor in the decision. Yeah, I, I love sorry, what Vegas, Vegas is doing. Yeah, uh, I love what Vegas has done. I mean, some people don't. Uh, some people want to talk about discourse and salary cap and LTI and whatever else. Um, Vegas went out and improved their team dramatically. Uh, yeah. Yes, they've lost nine of 11. That's accurate. But I don't think anyone is expecting Vegas not to make the playoffs. And if they make the playoffs, which we expect they will, they will be an incredibly tough out, oh, yeah. uh, especially if some of those other guys are healthy. I mean, Tomas Hurdle is a massive addition. This is a legit 1C on. On, I, I get it. He plays for the Sharks and that the Sharks are terrible. We've watched Hurdle in big moments, Sean. This is a very good power forward type of player. Noah Hannafin it helps an already stacked blue line. I mean, he's, I don't, sorry, I don't want to use the word never. We're talking about Bo Byram and, and him popping. I mean, Hannafin's never had a massive point producing season, Sean but he is an effective, mobile, puck-moving defender, and he still has the size of a Vegas blue line that had nobody under 6'1 last year. You have Shea Theodore, <laughs> Alex Petrangelo, and Noah Hannafin. And if Alec Martinez comes back from LTIR, there's another cup-winning defenseman. Nick Haig is an excellent defenseman at six foot four or so. Yeah. Zach Whitecloud is a third pair, a stud on the third pairing. So, uh, you know, you have to admire what Vegas has done in terms of their additions. Uh, whether you like their style or not is up to you. I applaud Kelly McCrimmon, and I, and I've, I've written this before. I think Kelly McCrimmon's going to have a huge play, a huge role in Team Canada. Um, at upcoming four nations face off Olympics, whatever else it is. Uh, he has done a great job. They're not afraid to sacrifice. And again, Sean, we understand why certain teams and a lot of teams value their draft picks and don't want to move them. And it's not that the Vegas golden Knights don't value them. They're trading maybes usually for sure things. Yeah. And, 
And that's was what happened. I mean, you can look at the list of guys they've given up. They're good players, but they aren't when they leave Vegas, they're not not many of those guys have have made people say, "Oh, wow, that's a big whiff by the Golden Knights getting rid of that guy." I mean, it's and again, that's not to say those guys aren't good players and that they weren't valued. They were valued by Vegas, but um, you know, management has done an excellent job in Vegas. Um, and we understand why people in this market uh, are not always fond of that organization, even though they have such man- such strong Manitoba connections on and off the ice. Well, they're a team that has terrorized the Jets more than the Vegas. Of course. Uh, but I'll, I'll say this, like all the people who are calling them cheaters and getting all upset. Hey, we do this job and I we always bring up like we always talk about that series that we covered, Ken, with the St. Yep. Louis Blues and Dallas Stars. We learned so much about those organizations that rings true to this day with a team oh, like Dallas. Tremendous. Right? The 2015 Stanley Cup final that I covered was one in which the uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning took on the the still relevant and best team of a decade, Chicago Blackhawks. The Chicago Blackhawks team was way over the cap that year under those rules. The Tampa Bay Lightning went and proposed that the rules change to close that loophole. They went and voted for it to change, and every other team in the NHL voted against it, including your Winnipeg Jets. So I, that when I hear fans complain and whine and cry about Vegas doing that and the Tampa Bay Lightning doing it, all I can think is your team had an opportunity to try and close that loophole and they chose not to. So there's no reason to sit there and whine and cry and feel sorry for your team. Cause your team in the one opportunity it had to try and take care of business chose not to, they wanted that loophole open for themselves. They're just not using it as good as those other teams do. It's a, level playing field as far as the rules go because your team isn't able to capitalize on it the way other teams do that's your beef with your team not the team that uh that is able to pull it off um vegas the best moment of the day ken was the response by mason appleton as we were in the jets room afterwards to go and ask them and and it was reported that they got a uh, hurdle right towards the end of it and the look on his face of like awe and almost like are you get they got hurt like you could see the look on his face like this was the kind of deal that like not only people at home were like give me a break the players are like seriously it's that it's that uh breaking bad if anyone watched that um <laughs> Well, no, and it's Jesse the Ken Weeb meme Walter. from Winnipeg Sports Talk. When well, it's it's the that, but it's the, 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 he the, can't they can't keep getting away <laughs> with this. Like it's just that <laughs> look was all over Mason Appleton's face. Uh, you got hey, hand it to Kelly. He pulls it off year after year after year. Their defense, like you said, is ridiculously scary. Uh, they've got like goaltending tandems. There's maybe a little bit of a question, but there was that same question about those goalies last year, and they took them all the way to the Cup final and look good, you know, to a Stanley Cup and look good doing it. Um, I, hey, maybe I'll burn myself and people look back and be like, I remember when Rennie said they were going to make the playoffs and they didn't. I have no doubt that the uh, that, that team is going to make the playoffs and I have do- no doubt that they will be the near the top of their capabilities come the playoffs. It would be a disaster for the Winnipeg Jets if they made it to first or second in the Western Conference and had to play the Vegas Golden Knights in the first round. That would be a tough, tough scenario. Um also could be the classic uh, you have to beat your biggest rival to go on a run scenario there but you yes go. i mean that would be a definitely an uh, you know a, a challenge uh, you know well the jets more- have made themselves ready to play anyone for so sure. that, that exactly. you say that about it like there's not a team that you look and say well they actually don't stack up with them very well because they can exploit this about them the jets like we said have created a bulletproof lineup um who else should we talk quickly about? edmonton want- i mean i quickly edmonton i mean i, I still They've done an incredible job under Chris Knobloch. There is no doubt about that. And, you know, I think Stuart Skinner at some point is could potentially be a guy that leads that team to the Stanley Cup. I don't think it's this season. I think the Oilers have improved. I like the Adam Henrique addition. You know, 
I wouldn't be saying that I don't like it because at one point I was advocating for the Jets to go after Adam Henrique. So, of course, I like the move for the Oilers. Um, you know, Mark Spector, uh, our pal, was on with Merrick saying how important it was. I mean, that moves Ryan McLeod to the wing somewhere. So, for me, I still think there's a big qu- – yeah, sorry, it's not a big question because Skinner was excellent during their long winning streak. However, I still think they have questions on defense and they're going to need some of their – um, complementary players to produce offense. Because if it's only Connor and Leon, that's not enough. Even with a 40-plus goal season from Zach Hyman, last year, Sean, Ryan Nugent Hopkins was a no-show in the playoffs for the Oilers. They can't win if that happens. But to me, they've positioned themselves very well for a long run. But they also could have trouble in the first round. So it, it's just the West is wild. Um, I, I love West the fact that wild. I love the fact that Barry Trotz went f- it, to a degree is going for it. They're adding players at a time when most people thought it was a sell-off. And Sean, I think one of the reasons why the Jets got Colin Miller instead of Alex Carrier is because Barry Trotz's team hasn't lost in forever, and they believe they can make the playoffs. And if they get there, you know maybe they can scare some people. I mean, I love the fact they went out and got some kind of bargainish type of players to maybe help their offense to a degree and kept a guy like Carrier uh, or Carrier who uh, our pal uh, Jason Buchel, I was speaking with him early in the week. Uh, he, he loved Carrier as a potential ad for the Jets as a right shot D uh, potentially to help the third pairing or to be in that rotation. So anyways, Oilers improved. Yes. Um, you know, got some physicality for the fourth line also. Uh, I still don't know if that's enough for them. Uh, Dallas, we know, added Chris Tanov. You know how I feel about Chris Tanov. I think he yeah. was a guy the Jets definitely were looking at as an ad, a potential ad on the right side. And then we know that he would have been in the top four uh, for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, Dallas also has a huge boost with Logan Stankoven coming in and playing the way that he has. Um, outside of that, I think we've got the West uh, pretty much handled. And in the East, there were some moves. Yes, uh, I, I'm not. I you know we're in agreement. We don't love what Carolina has done. No, I understand completely stanky. that you're looking for offense. Um, I, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I, I think that there's. I mean, get Gensel's, there's massive. Gensel's, pot- good. Gensel's good. That's they. They could use a little bit more of that. But I think Gensel is a guy who's really like done a lot in his career riding in the wake of 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 Genny Malkin and Sidney Crosby. Right. So can he be the guy who drives? Like I. I always look at yep. that team and I wonder who's the driver. Who's the guy who, when the well, chips are on the table, just cannot be held down. And Aho's the driver, and Svech is, hasn't been healthy. So now one of those guys has got to show that they're the driver and can score when it matters. Agreed. Which they haven't. And and like in, in getting Jake Gensel, they get a guy with like massive potential, but the Jets get a Tyler Toffoli. Tyler Toffoli has shown that he can be one of those drivers at that yep. crucial time. So, to, hey, if, if like especially for what they paid for it, if you are uh, if you are Carolina and you go get Tyler Toffoli, you at least get a guy who's been there, who's like got it done in really really big moments. Gensel, I don't want to take anything away from him, and I may be wrong about this. Uh, because maybe I'm what maybe I've just looked at this for years and looked at those really good players and haven't give Jake Gensel his due, but I'm not a hundred percent with Jake Gensel that he's going to continue playing the way he has when he's not on a line over the years, like he's been with the Malkin or especially riding shotgun alongside, uh, you know, the best player of a generation. That's, that's a big question mark for me. I'll just go back to the stars. I actually like, what the stars did in not doing anything. Logan Stankovan looks absolutely phenomenal. He's their deadline pickup and, and it works. They have a stacked lineup that I don't think they needed to add. I think the Dallas stars have been sitting around for a while now being like, we've made the playoffs. Let's just cruise through here and make sure that we're in the right spot. I don't think they care if they finish first or second or third or fourth in the conference. Um, 
I don't think that matters to them one bit. They, to me, are an extremely scary team. Uh, Carolina got no goalies, T. Mackey says as well. Um, but Dallas, to me, this is one of those situations where I think some people will be like, oh, why didn't they do anything? They were there already. And if they were adding, it would have just been adding to add. I don't think they needed to add to add. There's a lot in their lineup right now that aren't even popping right now. So you like if you're the Jets and Velarde gets going and Kyle Connor gets going and uh, Sean Monaghan gets going. It's scary to think of what they can do. There's a whole lineup of Dallas Stars players that you, if Mason Marchment gets going, who knows what he does? If Duchesne gets going, uh, Ben Sagan, Robertson, like they've got so Wyatt many, Wyatt Johnson, they've got so many dangerous players that can make, like there's nine guys on that roster that can make a difference nightly offensively. So they didn't need to add their scary. I still think, you know, you know how I don't have a lot of concern for the Colorado Avalanche when it comes to the Winnipeg Jets. I have miles of concern for the Winnipeg Jets when it comes to the Dallas Stars. Tanev only makes that, uh, a bigger problem uh they didn't need to add uh, and and th- th- they're where they need to be and the last thing too sean i was in the presser with jim nil the day after the tanev trade was made he said he prefers to make his moves in the off season and this was another example best free agent signing of the off season is probably matt duchene a guy who was bought out by the nashville predators because they thought they had to change their mix and Duchesne has been one of the most productive players in all of hockey out of free agents that were signed. And, and that's been a big thing for the Dallas Stars. And yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting. I mean, the, the, the beauty is now, Sean, now everybody knows what they have. Now go out and show what you are. Show what you yeah. are when it matters most. And that's what the beauty of April is going to be. The Jets have a great finishing road trip to the year. Then they have two home games. They play Minnesota, who is probably going to be out of it. Then they play Nashville, who might be their first round opponent. Then they play Dallas, who also could be an opponent either in the first or second round. And then, oh, by the way, checks notes, they play Colorado for the last time this season on the road. And it should be a fascinating matchup. And then, oh, by the way, the Jets go home and their last game of the year is against the Vancouver Canucks in what could be a battle for first overall, either in the West or in the entire league. And it should be beautiful. And I didn't say this before. And I meant to, uh, when you were having a great soliloquy uh, with about Josh Morrissey, Josh would never say this publicly because it's not the kind of person he is, but I think for a fact, he wants to absolutely shine on Saturday night in a game that also involves Quinn Hughes. And Josh wants to dominate in every single game, but this to me is like when Hellebuck goes head-to-head with Thatcher Demko. They don't think that publicly and wouldn't say it, but I think they absolutely want to go head-to-head with those guys and, and beat them. No doubt. Um, just a couple of comments here uh, that were made. Um, Patrick Guaz says Ottinger is not consistent. He's been pretty consistent against the Jets so far this year. And uh, on my list of concerns about the Dallas Stars, Ottinger getting something done in the playoffs is extremely low on that list. And uh, he's never lost back- to the Jets in regulation time. And he's been very consistent in the playoffs when the Stars have played well. Exactly. And go factopia says not sure that run and gun offense will work in the playoffs. Listen, the Dallas stars, you saw what they did uh, in the playoffs last year. You've seen years before. This is a team that knows how to get back to its defensive game. This is, this to me is the lesson the jets are learning this year that Rick bonus has been teaching them that is going to serve them well in the playoffs. The pat, the, the Dallas stars have learned this lesson and have had this lesson locked down since like 2009. 19. They know how to get to a defensive game. If you really think that the Dallas Stars are going into the playoffs with a plan to try and outscore Team 7-6, you haven't been paying attention. Dallas is a scary team. I'll just say something quickly on Edmonton. The one thing about Edmonton, remember a couple of years ago, Connor Brown, he was in Ottawa, correct? Um, yep, 20-goal guy in Ottawa. And I, I, I love Connor Brown. I thought the Jets should have been in on him this, this summer. But we know there's an obvious player. connection with Connor McDavid. But his knee's not back, and he is nowhere near the same player he was so far. 
so I've got I picked at the beginning of the year the Edmonton Oilers to win the Stanley Cup. I don't change off that because it's it's just too uh, like I'm going to stand by what I said. You I should. still think you, you think so. You should change your pick. Yes, you think so. I do think so. Yes. Okay. Good. I'm glad that you're saying that because I love it when you bet against Rennie. Doesn't work out well for you uh, very often. <laughs> anyway, um, the one thing that always concerns me about that team and the p- players they pick up, I like the pickups that they made. This is similar to Colorado, in which they went and they addressed the needs that they quite clearly have. I just think there's something about Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl that turns their their teammates into passengers like Connor Brown is nothing on that team and to me that was the exact kind of player they need to kind of round them out I just feel like there's just too much of a feeling of awe on those benches and all those players sit back and just say Connor's gonna do it uh, Leon Dreisaitl is gonna do it now if these guys can get over that uh and get into a situation like if you I look mean, at over lineup uh, ha, ha, but Hyman's been a passenger to it, right? He's been along with it. Nuge is another guy. If you get to play with those guys and you're on the ice with those guys, you get to be part of that. You take a look at their lineup. You know, even guys like Matthias Janmark, those are the kind of guys that you really need who can grind other teams and do the right thing. The Edmonton Oilers have every piece that they need. You take a look at their lineup. I don't look at it and I don't see like a ton of holes when they try to lock down defensively. When Stuart Skinner tries to play good defense, they've shown in the past that they have the capability to do it. What I need to see from that team is the ability for them to just take a look and say, okay, we very clearly know what our role is. And it's not sitting back and waiting for Connor McDavid to wow, wow and win the game. We need to go out and do our part. There needs to be something else there. And the two players they picked up can clearly be those guys who can help out, who can bring depth and depth scoring to that lineup. But with the Oilers, it's a, I need to see it to believe it kind of scenario because the, it, it is a compliment to Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl that they are able to take amazing players and turn them into passengers because you almost feel like you've got no role to play when that guy is constantly playing the the role night after night and the difference you take a team a look at the team like the winnipeg jets they've got involvement from the first line to the fourth line because there's a feeling up and down the lineup that every one of them is crucial to winning that game i don't think that that feeling that exists with the jets exists with the oilers and it leaves them in my mind vulnerable to just how amazing Connor mcdavid can be that said ken he's amazing and hard to stop, and whoever runs into them in the playoffs is going to have a handful in trying to keep that that team and hold them down. I'm not changing my pick as them hoisting the Stanley Cup this year. Anything else okay. we need to do before well we do, we go? Uh, just on the East, uh, I, I do like the, you know, again, we, we've watched Vladimir Tarasenko a lot over the years, and there's been mixed reviews. There's been times where he's been dominant. There's been times where he's been sleepwalking. Um I think it's a smart addition because he doesn't have to be a star there. He just has to be a complementary piece on a team that has lots of guys that can score and play two-way hockey. Uh, this guy's a flat-out sniper. I think he will fit well with that group. I think Paul Maurice will get a lot out of him. But the, my, it's a long-winded way of saying they're a team that can afford a guy who can be a streaky and sometimes inconsistent scorer. He's won the Cup. For a team that went to the cup final, I think he's a piece that will help them. Uh, Rangers getting Wenberg, I mean, to me, we're in Seattle. There were lots of good things said about Wenberg today. Um, I don't know if he's enough of a driver for me personally, but again, he's asked to be a complimentary piece there, and we'll see what happens overall. I like the Rangers team also in the East, but yeah, I mean, the, the arms race was in the West. The teams that improved the most were in the West, and you know, I'm expecting, like you, that the... Stanley Cup champion will come from the West, even though they will have a tougher path to the Stanley Cup final um, to go from there. Oh, sorry. The Rangers also got Rosovic, former Jet uh, yeah. forward Jack Rosovic, too, as a depth kind of piece there. So, oh, anyways, oh, oh. I, okay. And again, yeah, you, you picked you picked Edmonton. I picked Vegas to win the Cup in a back to back. We'll see what happens. We, we still, I still have 20 games to decide what my playoff pick is going to be, and we'll 
but I think that they're still a serious contender is what I would just say. Just remember when it happens, folks, Rennie called it and he didn't need that <laughs> extra 20 games. He just knows. Well done. Right from the beginning. Well done. Um, sorry. I, uh, just quickly on uh, Florida. I think Florida is an example of making moves. Say they're the opposite of what I just said about the, the Dallas stars. I don't think they needed to make moves. I don't think the moves that they made help very much. Those were moves just for the sake of making moves. That said a very prominent, um, coach in the NHL uh, who knows his stuff uh, told me that he thinks that they're the scariest and the best team in the NHL and the standard in the NHL right now. They sure are looking like that. Ken, a uh, quick question that was asked by the audience. I don't know if yep. I highlighted it, but I'd like to, if you, you know who you are, if you asked this question, a couple of you did, but the conversation about which team do you think is the better roster 2023 or 2018 for the Winnipeg Jets? What do you think and why? I think that with the moves the Jets have made, the rosters, although different in construction, um, I think, let's just put it this way, I think that that series would go seven games, and I would be picking this version of the roster because Connor Hellebuck is in his prime, whereas before he hadn't had the benefit of a true Stanley Cup playoff run behind him. And he's not going to go into the playoffs absolutely taxed because he played 65 or 67 games. Uh, the defense core is clearly better in 2018. There yeah. is no argument whatsoever. But the the caveat to that is that Josh is playing at a level that none of the Jets defensemen were playing in in 2018, including, yes, Dustin, including Bufflin. Dustin Bufflin. However, Josh doesn't play with the physical nature Dustin does but he impacts the game in as big a way as Dustin did, even Agreed. though he doesn't have the 6'6 six, six so. frame. And more sometimes so. more so. So yeah. do they score as easily as 2018? No, they do not. But again, I would take the new and improved version of Mark Scheife that scans the length of the ice and dives his way to breaking up a breakaway to the guy who scored 16 goals or sorry, 14 goals and had 20 points in the playoffs. Again, the rosters are very similar. I think the, the forward group is very similar, but Kyle Connor and Mark Shifley and Nikolai Ehlers are all in their prime now. No, they don't have Patrick Laine, but Patrick Laine, even though he had a great regular season, didn't pop in the playoffs that year. Neither did Ehlers. So I think this, let's just put it this way. I think this version of the Jets has the potential to go further than the 2018 version, but I think it's literally a coin flip when it comes to the roster. But because these players are so much better than they were without the benefit of having a playoff run, except one or two of them played in the four, no, not even one or two of them. Mark Shifley was in the four game sweep in 2015. Other than that, oh, sorry, Josh Morrissey would have been as well, but none of those other guys were involved in that series. So, uh, I just think that this year they have the potential of going further, but the rosters to me are a coin flip. And if I had to choose, I would take this version because of the reasons I mentioned Hellebuck fresher, Hellebuck more experienced and ready and same for Mark Shifley and Josh Morrissey. So I'm going to say that. And they I have Lowry. That, it's sorry. Lowry was also on that team too. Sorry. Maul. Maul has yeah. it. Lowry there, was there's, on that team too. There's potential for the Jets to go out in the first round here. Um, sure. There is. The, the way that things are shaping up here. I still say this roster is better, even though the 2018 was an interesting time. It was an interesting time because I actually think the, the league was in a changeover period, right? Like the Pittsburgh Penguins had kind of peaked and they were coming down. The Chicago Blackhawks had peaked. The LA Kings had peaked. So you had, it was a real turnover where the best teams in the NHL were kind of on their way down. Um, and there really wasn't as much competition. You don't get a team like the Vegas Golden Knights going to the cup final if it, in any other scenario other than that the league a little bit down. Washington hadn't been able to get there. And if you take a look, I read somewhere about their analytics. They actually weren't that, you know, as as good of a team as a lot of people thought they were in retrospect. I mean, maybe that says something about analytics, but I do think on that other side of things, you know, uh, uh, the the Ottawa Senators had been a really good pit team that had peaked and come down. There was just so many teams that were the good teams of that time 
that were falling down the other side of the mountain. It really was like a place in time. I don't, it, it, the Nashville Predators jumping up and being as good as they were, going from being a team that barely made the playoffs to a Stanley Cup contending team, and then the President's Trophy the next year, and then kind of falling off. I think it says something about the league. I don't think the league, at least at the upper crust of the league, was as good back then as it is now. It's my way of saying the Jets right now, I think, are actually a better roster for the things that you said, Ken. Connor Hellebuck is an older, more experienced goaltender. Uh, up and down the lineup, you, this lineup now, you've got guys like Vladdy Nemeskov who've gone deep before. Niederreiter has got a lot of experience. Now you've got Tyler Toffoli, who's won it before and been a crucial guy in the playoffs. You've got like the smarts of a Sean Monaghan. I think that there's just so much more maturity on this Jets team because in the end, it was the not having been there and not knowing that cost the 2018 Jets. There won't be that problem this year. I'm telling you right now, if the Winnipeg Jets lose in the playoffs this year, it will be an absolute war an absolute grind and the team that gets past them, if there is one will have deserved to get past them. It will not be a team this time around that essentially gets caught with their pants down, which is what I think happened to the 2018 jets. I think they went in, they got cocky. They thought that they'd won the Stanley. Connor Hellebuck said as much in a 32 thoughts interview. They basically thought that they had won the Stanley cup by getting past the president's trophy, uh, winning, uh, um, Nashville Predators, and that's immaturity. It's immaturity to think that it was going to be easy at that point. This team would never get caught like that. I agree with your assessment of Josh. And the other part about that is, yes, the fourth line had Brian Little as a fourth line center, but Rozovic was playing on that team. He was getting in and out of the lineup. This was a guy who didn't have that experience. Uh, you know, Patrick Lyon, Nick Ehlers, players who were in there, they were babies. They were babies. Just now the baby in this lineup uh, is probably not going to get in. Cole Perfetti is probably not going to play a lot of games. And if he does, it will be patchwork in here or there. Inexperience, not being there, not knowing what to expect, will not catch this team. I think they're just as deep up front. You're right. They're not as deep on defense. But I do think Josh Morrissey gets more done even compared to what Dustin Bufflin was doing there, he just has such an effect on this team. I think the 2023 roster is better, even if it ends up being a first round knockout. Um, they've really learned, like, and credit to to Kevin Sheveldayoff. He's learned the lessons. That's one of the lessons. There's lessons in failure. 2018 in the end, I think the Jets were the best team in the NHL, and they didn't win. That's a failure I think he's lost from, and I think it's helped him shape this 2023 roster into being a more capable roster. For sure. And, and just the inability to close out in game six absolutely crushed the Jets. There's no way around it, even though they went on the road and won game seven in an emotional game where they chased Pecorine. If they close that game out, they're not playing two ga two days later against Vegas. And yes, we know they carried the momentum and played on adrenaline in game one. And it was three nothing on Mark andre Fleury before the game was seven minutes old. But uh, and also, sorry, I just need to correct myself. Josh Morrissey was not on the 2015 uh, playoff roster. Only Lowry and Shifley um, on that one there. So, yes. Anyways. Okay. All right. Let's get to, uh, it's been a while, but let's get to the keg save of the game. What do you got, Ken? Uh, I think it's the, for me, it's got to be the, I know really nice save on Jordan Eberle is kind of a, you know, honorable mention, but I think it's the save on, Burakovsky on the breakaway and partially because it was aided by Mark Shifley who for folks who didn't see it or didn't notice uh, Mark Shifley got a, the right skate of Burakovsky in the head area and it caused him to be in concussion protocol he cleared protocol came back for one shift late in the third so the Jets uh, avoided a scary moment there but that's the save of the game for me uh, by Lauren Brassois on a night where he wasn't overly busy uh, that breakaway to me was the most important save of the contest. Uh, I'll, I'll go with that. I'm not going to argue with it. Uh, I'll just say, like I'd said, no difference in the Winnipeg Jets, whether Connor Hellebuck's in the net or Lauren Brassois is in the net. Uh, if that uh, if that burns you, well, suck it up and get over it. Um, that's our keg save of the game. Doesn't matter what we think, though. Uh, it matters what you think. So share with us your hashtag keg save of the game. Uh, if you do, you're automatically entered to win a $50 gift certificate usable at any of the three fine keg locations in the city of Winnipeg. Each location finer than the last. And the winner 
of the keg save of the game from last game. That would be Eric Hureleafson. Eric Hureleafson, your number well done, came Eric. up here. Good job, Eric. A guy who's been to a lot of the Kenny and Rennie live events. We'll be to that in just a little bit. But uh, Eric Hureleafson, you know what to do. Direct message me at SN Sean Reynolds. Give me your full name. Give me an email, and I will have the fine folks at the keg send you a $50 gift certificate usable at any of the three fine keg locations in the city of Winnipeg, each location finer than the last. And that brings us to our TCB lamp lighter. What do you got? Yeah, it's got to be the Shifley goal. It's the game yeah. winner. It's the brilliance of Josh Morrissey at the blue line. It's a great feed by Vladislav Nemesnikov. Uh, and it's very good finish. Now, Decord got a piece of it, Sean, as we saw in the replay. Uh, but Shifley getting to the net, just another great example of uh, the symmetry that Josh Morrissey and Mark Shifley play with. You asked Josh about it. Um, he mentioned all those hours, not only as teammates since breaking into the league as a full-time player uh, for Josh uh, in the 2016-17 season, but all of the hours spent uh, doing individual work, whether that's together or with Adam Oates. So uh, that's why I'm going with that as my TCB lamp later. To me, it's just Josh Morrissey creating something out of nothing. It entirely yep, changes this game. In the end, the Jets end up winning three, nothing. And there's probably, you know, people will look back at this score and maybe people will think it is a walk. This is truly a game that could have gone either way. Uh, and it's not because Josh Morrissey takes control of the game and takes it away from the Seattle Kraken. Uh, just another example of him being what I think is the best, um, the best balance of offense and defense by a defenseman in the NHL a player that I think uh, it's a shame. I don't think he'll get there, but if he's not top three in that Norris trophy conversation, I think it's a mistake. That's my lamp lighter. It uh, doesn't matter what my lamp lighter is though. It matters what you think. Share with us your lamplighter of the game, your favorite goal of the game, and you are automatically to win a frosty, delicious eight pack of lamplighter amber ale brought to you by our friends at Transcanner Brewing Company. If you cannot wait for Kenny and Randy to gift you your own eight pack, well, why don't you stop being a cheapskate and go on down to Transcanner Brewing Company and get an eight pack of your own? You can join them in their tap room at 11290 Keniston Boulevard, where you can get lampies, you can get blueberries, you can get Aero IPAs. There is an endless supply of beer there uh, and you got to go try them out each one each one as delicious as the last and of course the great pizza great food it's a great place to go where we will be having our fourth and final live knr podcast to be hosted on april 6th there's the link go there to get your tickets ken i don't know if i told you this we're already 60 percent sold out there so folks Impressive. Uh, it's just uh, a little less than a month away and that room has shrunk to the point that if you were thinking of going and you thought you were going to sit on your hands get off them it's now time to buy those tickets or you're not going to get into the room uh, so head on over to eventbrite uh because we'd love to join you or we'd love to have you join us for that last and final knr live podcast event going to be a ton of fun where we have great beers great foods it's just great atmosphere it's great uh the winner of the lamplighter from our last game that would be ollie o-l-l-i-e not a name i recognize from the show haven't seen it in the chat room ollie you know what to do direct message me at sn sean reynolds i need your full name i need an email you give me those things you have won yourself a frosty delicious eight pack of lamplighter amber ale brought to you by our friends at transcanna brewing company the nectar of the gods ken it's been a long time since we went over a buck 30 for a show <laughs> but we had to because nice quiet because hey, it was a nice quiet day today nice quiet yeah. day today for, well, for yeah, two guys exactly. that were at the rink at 8 a.m today and one of them hey, never left i'm gonna tell one you them never left I went to Guns N' Roses concert, second best concert I've ever been to in like 93. And they did a whole whack of uh, encores afterwards. Uh, and I learned from them, if the crowd gives you energy, you have to give that energy back. It's incumbent upon you to do that. The best case that I ever saw before, Ken, was Leonard Cohen. Leonard Cohen, when he was like in it, like in his final years, had a concert. I was on the floor at the MTS Center. I think he did seven encores, seven encores. And I have so much admiration for artists 
podcasters who, when their audience is giving them the energy, they try and match that energy and keep giving it back. We, we can't keep going here because we've got stuff to do tomorrow, but 759 people I'm counting right now, 761. It just bumped up to at two seventeen in the morning. Uh, Give yourselves a hand, folks. You absolutely nailed it here today. I hope we gave you the energy back and the good analysis back uh, because you most definitely deserve it. Ken's got something to say before we shut it down. Just quick one. Uh, absolutely awesome to see uh, this building for the first time, Sean. This completed my bingo card for the NHL arenas. Oh, number 32 for me, nice. Climate Pledge. Uh, saw a bunch of Jets fans on the concourse today. Stopped and chatted with several of them who... Who said hello great to see uh, incredible support for the podcast uh throughout you know not just north america but uh, we know we got uh, folks tuning in from uh, all over the map and uh, that's great we support we appreciate your support so much and yeah just a fun atmosphere in here and hey josh morrissey said it sean hockey night in canada on a saturday night not a lot of things that are better than a, a showdown between the jets and canucks should be absolutely uh, fabulous tomorrow as well yeah, no. And great to it. have you here with me on the road, buddy. Good stuff. Oh yeah, it was fun. Hey, we, let's get ready because the playoffs. We could be doing this for a while. Uh, hey, I, I'll I'll be adding a couple more loops to the to the belt here. Um, if we keep eating as good as we ate here, uh, good stuff. Okay, <laughs> great job, Kenny. I uh, want to say this before we go. If you appreciate the conversations happening in this space at two eighteen, two nineteen in the morning, please, please appreciate the contributions by our sponsors who fight to keep. The conversation going in this space for us that's vittorio rossi cambrian credit union sweet lou ferlin pristine roofing the kenny and rennie ogs in the johnson group the keg and of course transcanner brewing company thank you to them thank you to all of you once again it means so much that we've got you joining us and bring us this kind of energy we thrive off of it uh thank you for that let's do it all over again tomorrow after the hockey night in canada winnipeg jets against the vancouver canucks we'll see you after that